Hello and welcome to session prep. Hey chat, how are we doing? How's my sound? How's my video? Let's check all this out. There we go. Bring back a little, little me medieval music on the side. Some royalty free medieval tunes to get us in the mood. We are talking today about cities, city campaigns, city adventures. Why do them? What are the challenges? Uh, as you all know, uh, or you should know, I'm your co I'm your host, uh, GM Ben. I have my that side co-host uh, Thacko the D20 Mimic and I'm here to help you prepare your next session. Uh, I stream here on the Goodman Games uh, Twitch channel on odd Sundays uh, so watch the uh, show schedule over at goodman-games.com. Um, so if you're tuning in on Twitch welcome feel free to ask your DMing questions in the chat. Uh, I love to interact with chat and talk about uh, the topic that we're covering also just cover other gaming questions as well uh, related to uh, tabletop role-playing games I focus often on 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, but a lot of what I cover is relevant to all uh, tabletop games, including tabletop role-playing games, including Dungeon Call Classics. Um, so, uh, welcome. Uh, of course, if you're tuning on Twitch, be sure to follow or subscribe. If you're watching later on YouTube, hello as well. Be sure to like and subscribe to the video. And you can catch me. I've got some handles here. I'm on Twitter and YouTube at GMBen. I'm on uh, TikTok and Twitch at GMBenShow. Follow me for all the good updates uh, when I'll be on, as well as small clips and tips and other things like that. Yes, welcome all. Let me know in chat, by the way, if anything's not coming through, if my sound's a little finicky or the music's a little loud, anything like that. Happy to hear it. We can always fix that up. It would not be a stream without a glitch or two. Yeah, so today we're talking about city campaigns. Adventures in the city. Uh, I just actually uh, wow, count back the years. Four years ago now, twenty nineteen, I started a city campaign. Uh, that was the the this kind of magical city was the focal point for a whole host of adventures that took place in the city, left the city, went through portals, and I didn't realize I'd be running a city campaign for from twenty nineteen well up until twenty. 2022 i think we hit a conclusion uh did not realize it'd be going on that long but the pandemic started to happen we ended up getting a lot more insular just playing with the same group just kept going made it all the way to level 20 playing a city campaign so i thought i'd share some of what i learned some of uh what makes city campaign great some of what makes it difficult and how we can overcome those difficulties uh in this stream today uh and as i said before feel free to jump in in the chat if you have any thoughts questions comments yeah, so uh, I guess I want to start with what are the advantages to a city campaign? What makes a city campaign fun and excellent and why why do we want to run them? Uh, what is what is the pluses about uh, the campaign? I think one of the pluses and I asked throw that out the chat if anyone's with us live. Uh, I think one of the pluses is uh, one of the reasons to adventure in the city is there's always someone stronger. I think that's a wonderful element in your game. Always someone stronger. There's the, the heroes become little fish in the sea. Um, there's always someone tougher than them. That means that they can't just uh feel comfortable that they won't be challenged they can't just fall into a rut of oh we'll always succeed because they know full well that if they anger the wrong people they are going to provoke the ire of very potent factions or powerful npcs so there becomes constraints and they need to follow you know if you're in a small village by the time you hit tier two your heroes they might be dealing with the giants and the mountains and that's still a great adventure but your heroes are no longer constrained by the laws of the town. Uh, there's no longer the threat of uh, uh, of legal consequences if they're caught stealing. Uh, they can't even be kicked out of the town. Uh, you know, a fifth level party could single-handedly handle all 20 guards that patrol a, po a town with a population of, a, of 200 or something like that. So that's one of the advantages of City Campaign is you get to uh you get to lean as a dungeon master more heavily on the law 
on the other factions, the good factions, the bad factions, you can push back. The party throws a fireball in a small town um, without thinking about it and no one is hurt. Uh, they can kind of laugh it off when the captain of the guard comes and criticizes them. If they throw a fireball at a major city, uh, they can get arrested. Uh, the captain of the guard is probably 10th level in a city, maybe 15th. You've got elite factions capable of dealing with heroes. You can rein in your party a bit more. And if you don't do it with the law, you can rein them in more with evil factions as well. That's so when you're, there's always someone stronger, that means uh, the villains can be present from the start. You can meet your villains. Another advantage I think about. Meet your villains earlier. We always like that returning villain. We like that, uh, I'll get you next time. We like that uh, challenge to a duel. And it's really difficult to meet your villains earlier in the campaign when you're running a wilderness campaign. Because if the party meets the villains right away in a wilderness campaign, you're faced with this dilemma of, well, why doesn't the villain just destroy the heroes? And if they don't, it might seem contrived. Or vice versa, why don't the heroes just attack the villain? Maybe they'll win if they're fully rested. There's another tip. Don't introduce your... Uh, don't make sure you introduce fully rested heroes to your villain. Make sure your heroes are always on their last leg of resources before you introduce your villain if you, uh, if you want your villain to walk away from the encounter. Yeah, so the city campaign lets you introduce your villain earlier. Uh, they may not be known to be a villain yet, uh, or they could be protected by the factions of the city. Um, you know, if your villain is a noble person, they may be, uh untouchable until the party can kind of reveal the the wrongdoings of the noble person uh i think city campaigns as well have uh they have more cause to role play any campaign can have lots of role playing uh and you can see this is a strength uh, or a uh, disadvantage of city campaigns depending on what your group likes in a balance but if you're looking for more cause to role play it's certainly one of the advantages of a city campaign you can create more of these scenes where the players need to talk to someone and you can you can have more uh valuable developments you can have more plot progress locked behind a dialogue an encounter that involves conversation um if the if the party believes there is a evil dragon in human guys in the city um they learn a tip that the uh the dragon is drawn to um I don't know, some uh, some Thieves Guild. And so the party need to go to the Thieves Guild. The Thieves Guild are not the villains. So they don't go in, you know, swords drawn, fireballs blazing, so to speak. They have to go in and interact with the Thieves Guild and find out, is there anyone new here? Is there anyone of unusual powers that have impressed you? And then, um, you know, to them, uh, the dragon is posing as the Thieves Guild's uh, family member, the Thieves Guild Master's family member. That'd be a good, that'd be a fun scene to play. Um, so there's more cause for roleplay in a city. You can often have that happen a little faster, a little better. Um, another advantage to city campaigns that, that I found, that I found really, really worked well for them, is uh, there's more room for side quests. Uh, it's much easier to have something come up when you're in the city. And likewise... Uh, side quests that involve only that involve fewer party members. So, side quests for half the party. It's easier in a city to say that you. Okay, so let's say someone in the party who's really. Let's say you're going. You're, del you're delving into the paladin's backstory. You're really excited to. Um, confront the uh the head of the paladin's order but the paladin player says i'm gonna be two hours late well the city makes it much easier for you to go on a little quest have something happen develop something play out a scene and then as soon as the paladin arrives they can just walk into that scene because they can go to the party's home base uh they can uh 
uh, then have said, oh, well, clearly, you know, all my friends are off that Thieves Guild, so I'll just go catch up with them. Uh, so that's something that I like about the city is if you have fewer party members or you want to do a few more sessions, you know, you want to say, oh, let's do, you know, we play we play the main plot on every Sunday, but I want to do some minor sessions on Wednesdays for whoever can make it. We'll do some side quests. And if only some of the people come, city as an environment means that the party is, every character is just a, ja a little jaunt away from rejoining the group when they go off on their own. And they are, and they can be considered safe there. It's like, you know, if you're in, uh, if you're playing Curse of Strahd, it's not easy to imagine how does someone go off on their own in the wilderness then rejoin us instantly later. The wilderness is supposed to be dangerous. The city, there's room for safety. So anyone can be off on their own and rejoin the group. It's a nice little uh, dynamic there. Um, what what else? Oh yeah, I mentioned in the, when I, it's not something I'd thought of before, but do you also have uh, home bases? If your party, uh, if your characters like to draw, if they like to um, get into little mini games of spending gold and collecting uh, treasures that they find and displaying them, uh, I find that the home base is a great one, that a great little addition to a game that you don't you don't get. You lose out on the home base. You've constantly got a traveling game. Uh, Durthan says, "How do you avoid shopaholics when they're in the city? They seem to always want to waste a whole session on shopping." Well, Durthan, I would say embrace it. Embrace it. Uh, if the whole campaign's taking place in a city, uh, let them have that shopping session. Um, if if you're wanting to do just a uh, city adventure and they tend to waste time on shopping, uh, there are ways to speed it up. For example, you could just say, um, items in the player's handbook are freely available. Uh, we don't need to roleplay those scenes. You go to the market, they're available. So... You can tell them, um, you know, anything you want to buy for the player's handbook, buy that between sessions. It can be a day of passes, and you can be assumed to be successful. Uh, alternatively, you can take advantage of that opportunity and say, while you're out in the market, and you, you corner one of your players, while you're out in the market, you see something unusual, which uh, encounters in the city. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, one of the ways is you can just hand it off to them. Uh, of course, there is the question of buying magic items, and there then I can say that... Uh, uh, in my city campaign, what I did actually, as I said, all uncommon and uncommon magic items are actually available for sale in the city. Here's a chart with list of prices. You can simply buy uncommon items. Um, you don't need to, I mean, confirm with me, like, it's nice to hear what you're buying so I know from your character, but you don't need to ask permission. They are simply for sale. Uh, and then I came up with a little system where I would once in a while post a list of rare and very rare magic items that were, uh, came up, like, in an auction house for exorbitant prices, uh, that they could still kind of pursue and maybe eventually buy. But, uh, yeah. If you, though, are the person that likes to roleplay those shopping scenes, uh, do be cautious, because as Dear Than out, they can eat up a lot of your campaign, and then eventually you'll realize you don't always want to roleplay them when they, they can get repetitive. Uh, I would, I would say... Uh, as a guide, if your scene doesn't have something mysterious or something unknown, something dangerous, uh, don't roleplay it. And a shopping scene can have that element of mystery, that element of unknown. When, when the party arrives in a new town, uh, the shopping scene is a great scene to find out about the town, to find out what's going on, to get adventure hooks. It's great to roleplay that shopping scene when your party arrives in a new town because the shopkeep may say, Oh, I, I can't part with this silver sword because it's my last one. And there's Everyone's been buying them because of the strange creatures of the night. And you've got an adventure in your hands. But, of course, if the party is in the same city all the time, uh, that's that's when every little shopping interaction doesn't contain that, that mystery or that unknown or the something that might develop out of it. You don't always want to roleplay it. And I... I don't recommend you do. Find for your game the rhythm of where you do want to roleplay and where you don't. Yeah, so some other advantages of the city campaign. I welcome chat if they have any, uh, what's good about a city campaign? Why play it? What's fun about it? I encourage you to speak up there. Um, yeah, one I had there was home bases. Um, another one I like is when you play in a city, you have more room for a living world. Uh, if you play in the wilderness... Uh, if you have, you know, if you've got a town and you go off into the dangers of the of the unknown, of the frontier, of the dungeon, especially if you go in and you're facing undead and you're in ancient crypts, the world is often static and frozen, and that's a fine genre. It's, I, I, you know, I really love the classic dungeon crawl. 
I played a, a DM to game recently where I wanted to embrace the classic dungeon crawl a little bit, and I actually I I I messed it up. I wanted that classic dungeon crawl of just a dangerous, grim, dark stone dungeon with uh with darkness beyond the limits of people's torches and instead i made this living world of a faction of raiders trying to get into the same dungeon and i just fell back in my own ways of creating this living world so i like a living world and i think the city allows you to do that more easily um where you can have things shifting you can have developments you can have uh holidays going on that aren't connected to the plot, but if your party finds it interesting and leaps on it, like if you go, oh, the, the the festival of the thief is coming up and there's all sorts of jugglers and acrobats and performers and competitions and and you just you read that online and came up with it and someone goes, oh, that sounds fun. You've suddenly, you know you've grabbed your players and you're, you, know, you might say, oh, well, uh, that's coming up in a week's time, so uh, we'll get to that next session. Uh, you've got time to prep it. You've thrown it out as an idea. You see that your party's interested in it. You can prepare it for next session. But uh, speaking of which, I would say keep a calendar. That's a tip. A tip for city games. Uh, keep a uh, mini games are improved by keeping a calendar. Uh, I think I spelled calendar wrong. Mini games are improved by keeping a calendar. City games even more so. You know when those holidays are coming up. You know when you don't want to just use it for money and stuff like oh it's the the holy day and so all the shops are closed today. You have to wait till tomorrow. Sure, go ahead if that suits your game. But I mean more so, so you're aware, like, uh, oh, uh, 12 days have passed since you discovered that uh, secret entrance in the sewer. Uh, that means someone else may have discovered it now, too. City newspaper, during the excellent suggestion. Uh, I did something similar. It didn't It didn't take in my game. Um, I ended up... Uh, but, you know, the, the rumor mill, the, the classic rumor mill of uh, old adventures where you hand out uh, developments and rumor mills, you pass your party and say, what do you want to do? What do you want to engage in? Uh, my party just said to me, oh, those all those adventures sound great. Why don't you pick which one you want to DM? And I was like, well, thank you. I guess I will. But uh, but the, the city newspaper is a neat way to do that, where you can, uh, if you like typing it up, or if you don't like typing it up, using an AI to help you generate the city newspaper, but you can feed in uh, adventure uh, tips about upcoming adventures, adventure hooks, work it into your city newspaper, hand out uh, those rumors, uh, and see see what grabs your party's information. Or, grab, sorry, see what information grabs your party's attention. Uh, you you know, for example, if you put into rumor mill that there's been murders happening, like, oh, it was a city, clearly there's been murders. So you just, like, you don't think about it for more than 60 seconds. You say, there's been murders, it's strange. The murders are strange because there's a, a brand always being left in the corpses. So serial killer-esque. And you just put that in the newspaper. And if your party member's latch onto that and go oh, that seems really interesting let's find out more about that you know you've you've already hooked them for an adventure you haven't prepped anything for it that's fine uh run what you've got prepped for this session come back to the brands for next session say oh uh uh the victim tells you he'll meet with you tomorrow and you can handle that in a in a in game you can say uh not the victim tells you but say the victim's family members uh the 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 door person of the wealthy home uh, where the victim resides informs you the family is in bereavement and please they will they will greet with you tomorrow but not on this day of that they are grieving and you've uh, that's a in-game way the party will pick up on that hint and say oh, i'll come back tomorrow you can also say in a meta game way you can say to them uh you can say i want to do a bit more prep on this uh are you guys all okay if we grapple in next session and they'll be happy, you know, your party is not going to fault you for lifting the curtain a little bit and revealing that mechanical workings behind the scenes. Uh, I do like keeping the curtain, uh, the backstage curtain, uh, keeping things hidden, not revealing when I have things prepped, when I don't have things prepped, but it's fine if you do. Uh, it works out great. So those are some of my city advantages, uh, the great parts of running a city, why you should run a city, why, what you can get from it, why does it seem fun. I wanted to ask uh, chat, uh the inverse of city advantages what are some of the challenges what are some of the challenges of uh of running a city um I'll put some of these in our in our list here so i can turn the page on my on my uh, graph paper uh what are some of the challenges of running a game in a city what's difficult about it uh, wh you know why is the city campaign intimidating i actually used to find it intimidating until i endeavored to run one and realized how fun they could be um Bug Professor says, ever-present city authorities. 
It is, that can be one of the challenges. Salt Goodman says, onerous laws. <laughs> onerous laws, I think that's one of the challenges for the characters, not for the Dungeon Master. Dungeon Masters love onerous laws. Uh... Uh, I'm just going to calendar wrong again. Of course I did. Home basis? Oh, no, I got it. So. Durden says backtracking areas with map not as hard, but on the play is difficult. Yeah, chase through cities, bug professor. Yeah, yeah. These can these can be tricky. There are also some of the advantages of it. You know, I I like as uh, Salcom pointed out onerous laws. I don't find them onerous at all. I think they uh, they add some richness. Uh, if you can think up those laws in advance, maybe the prepping of the laws is the hard part. Uh, challenges to a city. You can prep those laws in advance. They uh, they can help constrain things. Like the party may know that uh, uh, they, if there are, of course, you know, killing a city guard would be even worse than murder uh, if in the, the the law of the city. But your party can know that um, attacking attacking someone can't be done within the sight of a guard, and you can use that. You know, your villain can meet with them when there is a parade happening and there's whole armies of guards on the street and that's when your villain shows himself knowing they are safe and can, can be used be conniving in that moment yeah Durden points out an interesting thing backtracking areas so if you're going back to other places and uh, uh with a map it's not as hard but on the fly it's difficult yeah a map there's I find that um, one of the one of the challenges is a city may take uh, like getting that map would really enrich your city, right? So a city may take more prep. A city campaign, um, but I think it, and I can just say yes. It, I think a city campaign does take more prep, but I can say it's kind of worth it, right? If you can put in that prep work. Uh, you can kind of get ready for the city in advance. Uh, you can a access, as we put over on the other side of the chat, access all those advantages. So there is more prep. So what, what are some solutions to more prep? Like, what can we do to overcome this? Well, uh, and I welcome chat. If you have your ideas for um, uh, how to handle the extra prep involved in the city, please share them. But one of the things that I think of is I tend to work in... Um, uh, well, I would say if it comes to a map, Find your map first, or draw your map first. I would say nothing is more tricky for a city if you uh, come up with a great idea. You're like, oh, okay, there's going to be a waterfall, and the city goes behind the waterfall, and then there's a great um, statue in front of the waterfall, and the castle is actually in the head of the statue with a bridge, and you're like, you've come up with this cool city. And then you will never find a map for that city online. You will be drawing it yourself. If you like drawing maps, you've excellent. You've given yourself a very cool challenge to draw that map. But I would say when you think you want a city campaign or you're arriving at a new city, search online or in adventures to borrow a map. Search for the map first. Look for your map, then come up with the city that is based around it second. So if you find a really nice waterfall city map, then you can make a waterfall city map, but maybe you find a waterfall one. You're like, nah, this city looks a little too high tech. My game is much more uh, uh, like grim, dark, uh, medieval. So you're looking for a different type of city. And then you find a cool city with like a almost like a vampire's castle on a cliff overlooking it. And you're like, and it looks like Strad's castle, but it's not. And you can your players are going to assume the evil of the castle and you can use that. And yes, the castle is evil or maybe not. And you just want to use that genre. You're like, cool. This is the one for my game. I wasn't planning on that like bat like castle perched on the cliff top but you found the map and now you've got ideas going through your mind so say find the map first i would say as well um when you're doing some of that prep like the onerous laws for example uh ever-present city authorities as bug professor says 
I would say don't uh, don't write out all those laws. That can be a little tricky. I would say um, prep in broad brushstrokes. Prep in broad brushstrokes. You know what do I mean by that? I mean um, if you've got the laws, for example, you just want to in one sweep have started your ideas of the, law, of, the, of the laws and have given a good enough picture in a single sweep. So for each thing that you want to come up with or think you need to come up with, like, like the laws, like maybe I should come up with some information of the laws. Just limit yourself to one sentence. That's my uh, prep tip. If you feel like you have a lot of prep, how do you do it faster? How do you do it more meaningfully? Limit yourself to one sentence per topic. So you got the laws. Well, you might say um, the laws are very forgiving to rich people. Excellent. You got one sentence. It's given you a, a picture of how this how the laws will work in the city. Uh, you might say um, the laws are draconian and harsh with v wicked punishments for small crimes. That was kind of a long sentence, but it's a sentence. You've given yourself that one broad brushstroke has started the brainstorming it gives you enough info to give to the players if they ask uh or when it's time to reveal it to them and stopping after one sentence it that leaves you room uh i find there's nothing worse than coming up with a cool adventure idea than realizing the adventure won't work because it contradicts contradicts some of the prep you've already done or told the players so if you do, haven't yet if you write out the laws you may have them that's kind of neat but uh but if you limit yourself to that one broad sentence, like the laws are forgiving to rich people, then when you start to come up with uh, an adventure, you might, for example, you might need a character who's 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 uh, run afoul of the law and needs help, and they're they're rich because they're going to pay the party to help them, and they're like, I'm a wanted man, I'm going to pay the party. So then you realize, okay, what is the one crime that a rich person couldn't get away with? And you're like, you think about it, and you're like, okay, killing another rich person or something like that. Uh, and then you've come up with a neat. Uh, you've left your one broad broad stroke, broad brush stroke about the laws has left room for you to fill in the gaps and fit them to your adventure later on. So I, I highly recommend if you, yeah, the city takes more prep, but what's a solution? One, find them at first. Great thing you have the map brought up there by Durthern. Uh, Durthern. Uh, prep and broad brush strokes. You know, limit yourself to one sentence when you want to cover a topic. Um, and then I guess I can also say when it comes to prepping the city, uh, Focus on factions. You know, like you want to get, like I, if a city is a living area, if there's a lot going on, how are you going to create that feel? And you could do it in four sentences by describing four factions. You've got the law. We say the law is forgiving to rich people. You need another faction. Well, we've got um, uh, a thieves guild. We already talked about that. So let's say... Um, there is a wealthy thieves guild that is above the law because of their uh yeah we get in a sentence there obviously they're above the law because of their wealth so we got laws for giving to rich people or lax rich people you got a wealthy thieves guild that is above the law and uh, you can picture them uh, more information come out tomorrow or <laughs> i was just reading the chat about the uh, jam tomorrow uh more information come out about the thieves guild uh, if you want to come up with a second sentence you can stop there they could be a family they could be um, uh, more of an adventuring guild that has other crimes going on, but you know you've, you've left yourself room. Um, uh, you need, you know, you got two more factions. What's another one? You could say, uh, well, we need a religious faction. We could say, um, the Church of All Faiths is the only person that helps the poor. One sentence. It's broad. You've got something going on, and we need one more. Uh, I'll throw that out the chat. Uh, what's what's another faction that we, if anyone has a faction from their game they want to share, or a brand new faction they want to invent on the spot? What's a one sentence city faction that will go with our law, our thieves guild, our religious institution that will really create a living city? And I, I welcome any ideas uh, in the chat. I can stop at three, so your fourth one will be the icing on this city cake. Um, Something like that, one sentence per faction, creates this living city. You've only written down four sentences. That's barely a paragraph, and you're almost ready. You've found a map. You've written down four sentences. You're almost ready to run this session as soon as you come up with your adventure, of course. Um, 
Yeah, I'll see if see if chat uh, the corrupt banking system. Why not? Bug professor says the corrupt banking system. Yeah, uh, you might uh, the Fisher's Union mafia like like them all. I like them all. Yeah, the Fisher's Union is a good uh, third uh, like fourth pillar of the city. The corrupt banking system is really going to be entwined with that corrupt thieves guild and the corrupt law. So it's it's probably there, but I see it working with them. A union is another like uh, some sort of. Um, like powerful workers organization uh is another sort of um real pillar or faction that uh brings to life certain areas of the city especially a fisher's union so you're in a coastal city you know you're going to be dealing with them if you go to certain areas of the city so that talking about those evil factions brings me to one of the other challenges that i faced when i was coming up with the city campaign which is uh where is the danger That is a tricky one. That is a tricky one. What what is dangerous? How where are there adventures in a in a safe city? My solution to that is of course don't make the city safe. You say where are the adventures in a safe city? Well, let's not have a safe city. So where is the danger? One of the ways to make sure the city is dangerous. And I also welcome chat to jump in on this one. How would you come up with danger in a city? What's the danger in a city? My first thought is, um, constrain the law. Slash guards. If you have, if your city has a good, noble, and strong legal system, uh, then there is no adventure. Um, you need a corrupt law, a weak law, um, an undeveloped law, a law that only polices a certain area of the city then your urban adventure becomes rife with adventure if you constrain that legal system um otherwise if you've got a all-powerful legal system a draconian potent near fascist legal system then it is going to be the villain otherwise what's left for the players to do right so constrain the law or alternatively make the law the villain uh either one Either one, uh, alternatively, make the law the villain. Either one is a way that you can still have danger in the city. Um, uh, one of my solutions to where the danger is in the city is what I call uh, big villains, small threats. Big villains, small threats. What do I mean by that? I mean, vill villains that are above the law, that are more entwined and potent than the than other heroes, than other noble factions. So that you know, uh, making your villain a noble person in the city is an excellent one. Making your villain a magical entity is an excellent one. Big villains become too strong to be to be bested by the other forces of good in the city. So big villains are one way you can have danger. Uh, and the other one is small threats. Like, things that are too small for the uh, other noble factions to always stamp out. That's your stereotypical rats in the sewer. Um, that's your pickpockets in the street. You can get a whole... A whole tier 1 campaign. Levels 1 to 4. Levels 1 to 5. Easily... Can be filled with just engaging with small threats in an urban environment you got the gangs the pickpockets the beasties in the sewer the, the things in the shadow things that slip through the cracks of society that dwell in um unprotected uh unpursued areas uh that's what can make up your adventure that's where the danger can come from big villains small threats is uh is one of the things that I think make up a good city campaign. The reason why I say that is think of you have a big threat. Um, big threat. An enemy army is coming. Uh, well then you're not playing a city campaign, then you're playing uh, a war campaign. Uh, think of another big threat. The world is ending. Well then you're not playing a city campaign, you're playing an apocalyptic campaign. Uh, think of another big threat. Uh, 
a dragon is holding the city hostage and asking for bribery. Well, then why are the heroes dealing with it? That's something that the legal system, the the ruling factions, the vested interests of the city would deal with themselves. Um, that's why I say big villains, small threats. Uh, Bug Professor says external threats from outside the walls, threats from under or over the city dropping in or infiltrating society. Absolutely. I think all those are great. Something that I didn't mention, which Bug Professor brings out, which is excellent, is you're having, if, you, if you're if you doing a city adventure, you of course want to be in the city. That's the nature of it. But if you're doing a city campaign, get out of the city once in a while. Leave the walls. Uh, go on a, go under the city. Uh, infiltrating society, I like that one as well, like doppelganger, something unseen. Yeah, but uh, we're doing a city campaign, but you can also... You can also go on it. You can break up the city campaign with a traditional adventure. Leave the city once in a while. But the world is out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I prefer to stay indoors. No. Uh, if you've got an adventure hook to go to an ancient ruins, uh, then you go to a dungeon delve and you, the city is waiting for you. And you're, you know, the city plots can be entwined into that dungeon delve. Like the Thieves Guild heard about the dungeon first and you know that they're already there and you're going to deal with them when you arrive. But now you're outside of the city, so the laws don't apply, and you can confront them in a different way. I think that's a uh, having threats outside of the city is an is an excellent one. Um, yes, yeah, so we have cities take more prep, but there are a solution. You know, embrace that prep and do it in broad strokes. We have where's the danger? Well, when you're doing, you know, you're thinking of these things, you can come up with that, come up with some of those uh, those dangers. Uh, I'll ask chat if they can think of um, any other challenges, but I will add one as well. One, my last one that I thought of. Sometimes the city takes more improvisation. That can be intimidating. The city can take more improvisation. Oh, Dirthen's come up with some already some content for us. A fence sells you a map. The X doesn't look like it's original to it. What party is not going to go to where that X is? They all are. It's going to be great. <laughs> Send the, give them a map. Put an X on it that looks like different ink. They're going to go visit it. Love that. Uh, so the city, when you're running a city campaign, it's going to take more improvisation. What does that mean? It means like, picture you're walking in the street. And, uh, or you've got a, you've got an encounter in a city street and someone says to you, what are the buildings like around me? Or I want to leap to the neighboring building. How tall is it? Uh, the dungeon is constrained by its very nature. The wilderness is consistent by its very nature. The city is neither of those. It is a multifaceted, multitudinous, uh, near limitless. Anything could be there. It takes more improvisation. And I do, I do agree. That's, that's probably the main thing that, um, intimidated me from running a city campaign until I embraced it a little bit. This, you have to be ready to think on your feet more of the city. But we have solutions. Um, one of my solutions is to narrow the focus as much as possible. Don't... If, if you're a dungeon master and you find yourself having to improvise, like if some, dungeon, if some player says to you, uh, what buildings are around me, right? And you're suddenly the dungeon master, you need to describe eight buildings? Uh, narrow the focus. So you might say, um, well, you're in the merchant district, so there's shops, uh, varying heights. What are you looking for? That's how you narrow the focus. Narrow the focus with questions. If you find yourself improvising, bring it back to a tight lens by asking the players what they're looking for. I was discussing this with a friend um, about city campaigns when I, I thought this is something that will really help. So your party says to you, um, uh, who else is in the inn with us, right? You can face this challenge when you're running a, 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 like a village game as well. Who else is in the inn with us? And you might say, uh, it's half full, you know, it's lunchtime, it's half full, there's another 10 people in the inn. What are you looking for? And then they might say, oh, I'm looking for someone to pickpocket. Excellent. You can describe a good pickpocket target. Then you're only describing one NPC, not five, not ten. If someone says, "What well, buildings are around me?" You might say, "Oh, you know, they in the in this this is an old district uh, with manor houses and estates, and the buildings are typically you know two to three stories high." What are you looking for? And they might go, "I'm looking for a window I can climb in." Excellent. Ask your players what they're looking for. If you find yourself improvising too much, bring it back in by communicate with communication um 
But my other tip for uh, avoiding having to brew so much is prepare some prepare in advance. Prepare some NPCs and encounters in advance. These will help you so much. And that's what I want to spend the uh, rest of the stream working on a little bit, is we can prepare some of these encounters together. Uh, we can come up with some things. So the reason why I think the city is such a wonderful uh, setting for adventure, which we didn't get to as much when we were talking about the advantages, but you've got living world over there. Room for side quests. Is there's always things happening. So you take out a blank sheet of paper, right? And you've got time to prep. Take out a blank sheet of paper and you go, I want to come up with 10 things that can happen in the street that will turn into a miniature encounter. And you might take up another sheet of paper and you go, I want to come up with 10 non-player characters, NBCs, that my party can meet and will be interesting and engaging to meet. And suddenly you've got a list of 10 city happenings and you've got a list of 10 NPCs. And with those two lists, and you cross them off as you use them, you add to them as you think of more, maybe 10 is too long. Start with three each list. You cross them off as you use them, you think of more as you go, and you are ready to run a city. You know, then someone says, who's in the inn with me? You go to your NBC sheet. You go, uh, a strange looking man with one eye uh, and a pet pot belly big pig. Where'd that NPC come from? It's on your list. You've got something interesting there. Someone goes, uh, I go out shopping. Uh, I want to buy plate armor. Is Can I get plate armor for sale? You know, and they are looking for cheap plate armor. And you might just say, uh, the, no, you have to buy from the player's handbook. But instead, you you realize, you know, only half, like, uh, you, you know, it's, it's early in the evening. People haven't shown up yet. You just got two players. One of them says, I want to go buy plate armor. You look down your list and you realize you have this cool encounter that take place, takes place in a store where um, uh, some kind of method is invisible in the store and um, uh, stealing things from the shopkeep. And you've planned that as an encounter. Players see a method stealing from a shopkeep and you're like, bingo, let's use this. We'll play this little encounter. That's over in our advantages over there. Room for side quests, even splitting the party. Not, all, not everyone's there. Let's play this encounter with a, this strange method creature stealing from a shopkeep. So uh, let's brainstorm Let's brainstorm some of these uh, NBCs uh, I'm not going to cover in, in this video. Uh, I think that might be a great topic for a future video. NBCs. I'm going to make a note of that. NBCs. Great topic for video. Um, but let's talk about city encounters and let's brainstorm some together. Uh, in my last video, I talked about Spotlight. And when I talked about monsters, I talked about uh, this as well. I talked about making things custom for your party. Talk to it where possible. Uh, why not? If you're if you're if you're creating new content, you know, if you have an inspiration, like if, a, if an idea comes to you, you're like, oh, I want I want a scene where there's a sink. I saw a YouTube video of a sinkhole. I want a scene where this, there's a sinkhole in the city and it starts to open up beneath the party and it's just bad luck. But they are there when the street gives way and there is this room beneath that they are the first ones and there's could be treasure, there could be threats and they're the first ones there. So why not explore it? That's like a neat encounter that came to you. I'll start with them. I just came up with that right now. Let's use sinkhole. Let's start with sinkhole. Uh, first encounter. One. One on our list of ten. Sinkhole opens. You know, you've got this cool idea. You get it from somewhere. You add it to your list of city encounters. Uh, little one. Single encounter city encounters. Uh, of course, there's always room for more. Was there another room beneath the sinkhole? But, uh... I was, I was saying as well that it's always great when you can, if you're designing in advance, why not make it custom to your party? So how do we make this sinkhole more interesting or engaging to my party? So that's where I wanted to ask chat. Uh, tell me something about the characters you are DMing for or a character you're playing. If you want, we can come up with content for any type of character. Tell me about the party you are DMing for. Tell me about one of the characters. I love to make content for uh, your parties. Uh, I love to come up with encounters that will engage the characters you're DMing for. Or uh, feel free, if you're interested, just describe one of your own characters and we'll think up some interesting stuff. But uh, while you're doing that, chat, coming up with any ideas or letting me know about your characters. I want to talk more about this sinkhole. So a sinkhole opens. That's neat because the party is the first ones there. Uh, I, when you have big, big threats, 
as I said, it's like you kind of face this question of why is the party the ones engaging with it? Why are they, uh, um, why are they the heroes in this instance? Why not the city guards? Why not someone more powerful? Um, the party is already there. That's the hook. That's what will bring them in. And admittedly, maybe you only want one thing underneath. So you, uh, you don't want to open up a full dungeon because what if the party says, uh, what if they run away from it? What if they're like, this is too scary or we're not going down there. Uh, so maybe you only want it to be the one room underneath. You don't want to do a bunch of prep that your party abandons. So let's say a one, one room. What is the cause? Um, the cause is a burrowing creature. That's an easy one. That way, um, if you want there to be linked to some um, ongoing development, something more serious, uh, burrowing mole says Durden. than yeah, let's have a mole. Uh, and let's make it a dire mole. Why not? Um, if you want it linked to a more serious development, you can have seismic activity, you know, the apocalypse is coming, this is just but a taste of what is to come, something like that, sure, why not? But let's, let's keep it restrained in this instance. Um, it is neat if you can link these encounters to the other things you brainstormed, you know, we came up with the, uh, Thieves Guild, we could have thieves are tunneling under the street to get into a safe nearby. We've linked it into some of our factions, we've got more things going on in this living city. But we don't need to do that in this instance. You can have an isolated little encounter. You've got a burrowing mole. That means the party will know that when they deal with the mole, they've solved the problem. Unless there's hints that there's a whole infestation of dire moles. But you've got a single dire mole. When the party deals with it, they know they've solved the problem. So it helps keep it safe and cont contained by putting, the, by putting the solution to the burrowingness right there. But the mole happens to reveal... Um, a sealed off basement chamber uh and it's not a vault you know it's not a tomb it is uh it could be just uh an extension of a building that was once sealed off walled up if you will uh sealed under the city sealed dungeon room and you know what task of a month uh rats in the walls let's literally have a corpse sealed up And why stop at corpse? Let's make it a ghoul. You've got a dire mole. You've got a ghoul. There's room for a lot more with a trophy of a red herring. Do it. I mean, I I was I don't know if you meant that literally or not, but like, actually, why not put a fish trophy in there? Uh, I love putting those little jokes in my games. Sometimes don't use them all the time. Some games though, uh, it, it applies to them perfectly. So there's a little, you know, a little encounter that you can come up with. It's it's kind of combat focused because it's not linked to role playing, which is a, one of the things you can do in the city. Um, so let's make our next one more RP focused. Sinkhole is more combat exploration. Um, you can also, you know, you come up with the numbers for it. Like uh, we're currently brainstorming for any system, but you could come up with, you know, when the sinkhole opens, it's... Uh, a dex save DC 13 versus, you know, 2d6 damage. You can come up with these sorts of things. Uh, that depends on um, uh, the level of party, though, right? And we're not uh, we're not uh, specifically designing for any tier, but I would say if you're about to have a fight underneath the dungeon and you're, you're thinking this encounter is for when there's the whole party is not present, then I think 2d6 damage is just, just enough. Uh... I would say the 2d6 damage is um, is what happens if they fail to save. I would say all fall in. You could screw up by having your party actually not fall in. Like, let's say you came up with this encounter, right? And you want the sinkhole to open, and then there's going to be a burrowing mole and the ghoul awakens or something like that. Uh, but your your characters make the deck save. They, they don't fall in. They're standing up on the on the rim of the pit looking in. Uh, they see the mole. They see the corpse. And they go, you, you know what? Let's go get... We're not all here. Let's go get my friend. Let's go grab help. And you were planning a single encounter with a single fight. And they run and get help. And you're like, oh, man. Like, while they're gone, clearly the mole's going to leave. Then the single ghoul is not that much of a challenge. Well, time to upgrade the ghoul to a ghast or whatever. But uh, that's why you think of that in advance. 
say that they're in the middle of the sinkhole, they fall in no matter what. They are in the collapsed room. Climbing out's not difficult. It's the mole that's difficult. But uh, the, the deck saving throws against taking the damage. It's a difference between falling prone and tumbling in and just sliding down a slab of street and arriving kind of at minimal zero damage, but a little, uh, a little worse for wear. So that's one type of encounter. And put this on your list of encounters for your city. You can pull this out of your back pocket at any time to keep the city alive. Uh, and this isn't just for this isn't for your core adventure. This is a little encounter to have a living city. So Durthan says, I was thinking of encounter two, and Durthan says, mistaken identity of a party member. A messenger thinks they're so important, more, more, more important. I love it. That is an excellent one. So mistaken identity message. Yes. <clears throat> the the main focus of this, you can say, mistaken identity message. The main focus, you can say, is a uh, messenger approaches you, says, uh, calls you by the wrong name, uh, hands you the scroll, and says, and immediately says, I take my leave of you, and maybe runs off or departs before um, it can develop. <clears throat> that way, they're, they're left with the scroll, and they're left with the difficult decision. Am I unscrupulous, and I open it and read it, or do I find the right person without opening it? That's a nice... We talked in other streams about difficult decisions. That's a nice, easy, but kind of, nonetheless, a significant decision. Um, party must decide, read the note, return, or return the note. Or both, but the order matters. And in this instance, read the note or return the note. You may brainstorm predominantly the encounter. The note is meaningless, you may think, and the predominantly the encounter is um, uh, if they return it on if they return it sealed, they get a reward. If they return it unsealed, uh, they've broken it, they get no reward. And that may be a very simple encounter, but this is your opportunity. What a great little encounter Durden has come up with because we can link it into our factions. What if it was meant for a rogue in the thieves guild? What if it referred to the arrival? of the guild master's cousin who the dungeon master knows is the dragon in disguise but the party do not yet know that and it's in it's informing uh someone important of the arrival of the guild, guild the thieves guild master's family member then you've even developed something more interesting one of the party members looks like a significant member of the thieves guild how will they use that in the future nice little twist It means the party, the character, has a doppelganger. And I, of course, mean doppelganger in the lower D dictionary sense of the word, and that uh, a lookalike. There is someone out there that looks like the character member, and that is a useful and valuable development in the plot as well. So, we've got a sinkhole opens, a nice little exploration combat scene. We've got a message with a mistaken identity. Uh, these things can be one or depending on how confident you are with your own improvisation, you can come up with full details for these little encounters uh, and save them, right? They're in your back pocket for now, for this adventure, for future adventures, or you can uh, you can just come up with one or two sentences, depending on how comfortable you are improvising at the table. You can uh, just say a mistaken identity message and you can improvise over there. However, What's in the note might be an important thing to think about in advance. Uh, what's in the hole? That's worth a second sentence. These might be two sentences, two sentence encounters that we've come up with here. Uh, de though, depending on your confidence um, improvising. Uh, so we could do a third one, but we're coming up on the end of the stream. Uh, I think your imaginations can fill in that gap. I want to use the end of the stream. If anyone has any Dungeon Master, anyone in the chat has any Dungeon Master questions, uh, gaming questions, Game Master questions, tabletop role-playing game questions, or Dungeons & Dragons questions that I can answer for you, uh, any tips that you're looking for, things you're uncertain about, I would happily uh, wax away at that topic for a little bit. It's a little bit of time we have left before us. Um... 
And I can say that uh, City Adventures, since I've run quite a city campaign, I don't want to do one now in the near term. I like to mix things up. After I run something for a while, I get kind of a little bored of it and want to explore other genres of play. But the city campaign is something near and dear to my heart. And it's for those reasons that I outlined. That you kind of have this living world. You, you know, it seems safe. But once you start to brainstorm why the city is dangerous, you realize there's danger everywhere. And it's, you know, in the dungeon, when the doors are locked, you are safe. In the city, you are never safe. There is always a threat. Uh, the Thieves Guild, once the Thieves Guild wants revenge, no locked door can keep them out. You know, you are, when you are in, the, when you enter a dungeon, uh, you're a stranger, no one knows you, no one knows you're there if you're doing it right. When you're in the city, you make enemies, and you have not defeated your enemies easily, so they are still about, they are still ready to take revenge on you. Those are the things that I like about a city campaign. Uh, they can become more vivid, more dangerous, more multifaceted than a dungeon campaign. And the challenge to them, they take more prep. They do, but that prep uh, can serve you for many, many sessions, right? Once you do a little bit of prep on a city campaign, you will be ready to run the city for sessions to come. Your list of 10 encounters, you might use at most two per session. So uh, you come up with this list, you're good for five sessions, probably more. Your list of NPCs, that can be even shorter. What I did for a recent town campaign is I made up uh, little pieces of paper. It was actually like a grid on a sheet and I chopped them out. And I put, uh, on each sheet I put a name, I put a character trait, I put a descriptive trait. So something how they roleplay, something uh, how they look, and something that, they, that is a secret that they feel inside that they wouldn't tell the party or wouldn't be revealed right away. And I cut those out put them in a little cup, kept them with my prep notes, and whenever the characters met an NPC, I drew one at random, and uh, this person's playing with their button, this person has a strange scar on their face, this person seems to really like the party for some reason, and I was, uh, had those available, used those, and it was, it was like, that was my list of 10 NPCs. Uh, Durden says, I've had success with the pyramid style planning, have encounters, and how they do or don't connect. Oh, I like that as well. Uh, if you could elaborate on pyramid style planning, I'd be pretty interested in that. But if you mean like um, multiple encounters and see where they, what's their commonality, and then what is those commonality leading towards a final encounter? Because that's kind of what I'm picturing. You got the individual encounters along the bottom, and then the second row is uh, like, for example, you get the ah oh, yes, right on yeah. So what Jordan would be talking about is you get the the message from the thieves guild, and um, and you are uh, recruited by a Thieves Guild member, and either of those could lead to the Thieves Guild uh, base. You have two possible um, um, entrance points to the campaign of getting embroiled in the Thieves Guild. Yeah, I like that as well. I didn't talk... Uh, I talked about running campaigns in the city. I did not talk in this in this as much about the how to do a broad adventure, how to do um, one... Like a, that's I think an important one. How do you run an adventure when the party can just walk away from it any time? The dungeon is constrained. The city is open. Well, how do you run an adventure when the party can leave? How do you run an adventure when the party can um, uh, mix and match and go to a different location in the middle of your adventure? And I think Durden has got a great suggestion there of the uh, pyramid style planning. Uh, not something that I covered in in this stream, but a great topic nonetheless is adventure structure in the city. Uh, how do you run a single adventure in a city? Um, excellent thing to to talk about. Great topic. Hopefully, audience, I have spurred your imagination here a little bit for running your own city campaign. Uh, that's it for today. Thank you for joining me on this adventure. I stream odd Sundays at 4 Eastern, so watch the schedule over on at goodman-games.com as well as on their social media or my social media. So... Be sure to like and subscribe. I have again on uh, Twitter and YouTube at GM Ben and Twitch and TikTok at GM Ben Show. And as always, have a good session.